Hi, this is Bob Sorrentino from Italian Roots and Genealogy, and I'm here today with Carol Malzone. And we're going to talk about a little bit about her research, her unbelievable number of trips to Italy, and, uh, and the book that she's writing. So welcome, Carol. Thanks for being here. Uh, thank you, Bob. It's a pleasure. Uh, so um, my first question for you is, you know, uh, when and why did you start researching the family? Uh, well, um, I had a missing grandfather um, who was always sort of in the shadows of my life. And I very, very early on just, uh, the first piece of research I did was just writing to the New York State Vital Statist Bureau of Vital Statistics to find out that he had died. So that was put on the shelf and nobody did anything until in 1992, I came in possession of a box of letters, hundred year old letters. They were written from 1920 to 1925. Um, and most of them were in Italian or probably a Sicilian Italian to my grandmother. And that sort of start, that really actually started the ball rolling because I it opened up so many uh, areas of, of secrets and things not talked about that I think is pretty common in most um, immigrant families. So, and that was actually prior to the letters. Um, I had also done some research in New York State to find the siblings of my grandfather. Even though he was dead, I wanted to present my mother who was moaned all her life that her father left her at a railroad station when she was four years old in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. And that, court of, that sort of was set the standard for her rather unhappy troubled life. So um, in 1992, just before the letters coming to me, I decided I was gonna do something to make my mother happy. And so I, back then, of course, there was no internet. And so I took to the Tampa library where I was living at the time and looked through microfilm for hours and hours and came upon city directories. And I found um, a neighbor uh, that had lived across the street from my grandfather. From that, I was able to find a brother, a surviving brother. There were two of my grandfather, which would make them half brothers to my mother. And uh, one had recently passed away at that point. The other was living in Arizona. So I connected them. We actually had a wonderful reunion or a union uh, in Tampa with her half brother and my mother and her full brother. So because of that, my uncle in Pittsburgh, where we're from, um, unearthed this box of letters from my grandmother's trunk that he had held since my grandmother had passed away. That's how the letters came to me. And then um, many years went by before I could actually get into the letters. I was married. I had a young, young family. Um, a lot of life's um, uh, obligations were in the way. And then finally, uh, one day, the Internet opened up and voila, you know, that's it was an explosion of information. So that was um, that was the start was the box of letters. Yeah, well, that's a treasure trove of you know, to find something like that is, that's incredible. Um, my, um, you know, my, when, when my, um, when my aunt, my godmother, um, passed away, she apparently had, I guess, a lot of stuff, uh, because she lived with my grandparents and, um, my cousin in, uh, Zephyr Hills in Florida had put it all in the garage, the garage leaks, yeah. and it was all just junk. Just gathers mold. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it, it all had to be tossed. So, uh, but to come across, I mean, you know, you're lucky sometimes you find a letter or two, but a hundred is amazing. So, so these were from your grandfather to your grandmother. So she, he was she in Italy, and he was writing her. Or... No, no, my my uh, by this time my grandparents had all emigrated to the United States to Pennsylvania back between 1906. In 1910. So they were here. So my grandmother and my grandfather met when they were here. He, She was 16, he was, or 14, actually, and he was like eight years older than her. The letters were, um, only six of them were from him to my grandmother. Uh, they went from, I always say, they went from I love you to I'm leaving you. Um, <laughs> and in between, were these wonderful letters in Italian that were written by his sister, who was mm -hmm. here in Pennsylvania, who wrote to my grandmother. And it told it, these letters eventually um, uh, opened up 
uh, and just blew out of the water all the family stories that we had been told about my grandfather. So none of what we had been told was true. One of what, which was that his mother, who was also here in, uh, in when I say here, I'm putting myself back in Pennsylvania. Um, she was also in Pennsylvania. His mother, he always told, was um, the daughter of a, let's see, the, the, it varied. She was either the daughter of somebody from the, um, uh, the House of Savoy and someone from the Vatican who was paid by a family in Italy to raise her. Um, I found out um, that actually I have to give credit to Angelo Cornelio. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Mm -hmm. He lives in Buffalo. He's a wonderful treasure trove of information. Uh, he is a genealogist. He was an engineer, but he's also an educator. He wrote a book called Lady of the Wheel. And the wheel, if you're familiar at all with the, with the uh, you, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, with the, yeah but for everybody listening, why don't you tell it? Okay. Um, the, the wheel is actually, uh, and I can't wrap my tongue around the, the Italian word, it's the Roto dei de Proetti. And what it is, it's the wheel of the castoffs. So sometime in, I think it was like the 12th century, Pope Innocent III um, noticed that there were all these dead babies floating down the Tiber River. So he instituted this practice throughout Italy, and I think through other Catholic countries as well. Um, and but very, I think it was very predominantly uh, active in southern Italy too. Was that on the outside of either a hospital, or community building, or a, a convent? They were, there was this protrusion on the outside of a building. So the, the mother who could not either, uh, was either not wed and couldn't cha you know, face the shame within her, her, her uh, environment, or some uh, oftentimes people just had too many children and they couldn't uh, take care of all of them. So they would come in the dead of night, they would put the, I, I make it more dramatic, I'm sure they came in the dead of night. <laughs> they placed the baby in that little outside protrusion, ring a bell, and there's an attendant in the inside and they would bring the baby in, pick up the baby, notate whether it was a girl or a boy, um, whether there were any markings on her, how she was dressed, and then they would she would be given a name and baptized and that was most important because that would if they died which many of them did they would at least you know be go to heaven and um i found the record because of because of angelo he uh his book and then after i read his book i had some conversations with him and he directed me how to find my grandmother's birth record so Here's the woman who was supposed to have been the, uh, you know, the princess, uh, the illegitimate princess or whatever, and she ended up being a foundling. They, as you know, the Italian records are, they keep meticulous records. So on her record, it even notated that she was found on, in the wheel of the community building that was next to the baker and um, that she was given the name of Maria Carbone. And Carbone, of course, uh, was belonged to nobody within certain areas so that uh, in, of the where she lived, so that nobody could be accused of being the mother or the family that that brought this child, this illegitimate child, into the world. Um, so it, it was a practice that was, in many ways, very um, well beneficial, obviously, to to the person who survived. But in many time, many cases, in Angelo Cornelio's book a lot of these babies, if they were males, went to work in the sulfur mines. So they needed to su keep supplying those sulfur mines with young boys, which is a dreadful story. It really is. But my grandmother was fortunate. She somehow uh, managed to grow up and she was someone took care of her. And I do have some ideas who that was, but, and that's something that I'm still trying to find out. Um, you, you know, I tried um, just recently on Facebook, I think, I uh, tried getting in touch with Angelo, so um, I'd love to talk to him. I'd love to interview him. And uh, another interesting, well, two interesting things is uh, my wife, her uh, her grandfather was, his name was Proietto, uh, but I don't know how far, you know, I don't know how far back it goes. I know I got uh, at least back to her third great-grandfather, but obviously somebody in that chain yeah. was probably abandoned. Right. Uh, and something I just learned recently from somebody who was adopted in Italy in 1963, um, that even today, the women could 
uh, don't have to claim the baby. He's his his birth record has uh, you know unclaimed. You know the mother was unclaimed. Yeah, you have to put her name. Yeah, shocking. Yeah. You know, in this day and age, that, that's that's pretty surprising. It really is. But yeah, yeah, isn't it? Yes. Uh, so he, you know, he what he does is he helps he helps uh, children that were adopted in the '60s and '70s to try and find their wow. their birth mother. Oh, that's um, wonderful. Yeah. Um, because it's very, 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 very hard to do. Oh, I'm sure. Um, uh, so, um, so that so now, did you know who raised her? I don't know who raised her. However, on her birth record, which I find very interesting, it it always gave the name of the midwife, and the name of the midwife was Mar Maria. If I remember this right, because it was corrected, um, Maria Tricamo, T R I C A M O who was the spinner of thread, who was married to Stefano Trio, T-R-I-O. Well, on Ancestry or 23andMe, I did both of them. I don't remember which one. I'm actually related to Tricamos and Trios. Ah, so I hmm. think, in fact, I wrote this sort of in a fictional way in my book, um, that the, because oftentimes they would come and get the child. In other words, perhaps one of these, you know, the woman, the family that actually gave birth to her would come and claim the child and raise it, even though they didn't want it to be known that it was illegitimate. And also, they were paid by the, uh, these wet nurses were paid by the government or the church or some official body to take care of these children up to a certain point. So this is what I think happened. No proof, but... Um, well, it's possible, and, and I know I know um, sometimes they would put they would they would leave like um, a ribbon or a medal or something with the baby, so right. that they could come back and yeah. say I'm the one who left the yeah. yellow ribbon or whatever. Right. Yeah. No, no such thing with my grandmother, but um, you know it was really fun. It, another story that circulated in the family was that my grandfather was the spinner of tales, the one who left my mother at the train station. He's she was four, and he took her with. Um, my grandparents, my, my grandmother was in Uniontown. She had just given birth to my, uh, uh, my mother's brother, younger. And he and his mother, they were living in Glen Campbell. Do you know there was a Glen Campbell, Pennsylvania? I didn't know that. <laughs> it's a little town that was a little, uh, during, uh, during the, I guess, right before the World War I, it was um, a boom town for coal mining. So my grandfather was a barber, and as his father was a barber, and they were one of the only Italian families. Uh, they were mostly um, Eastern Europeans who came to work in the mines. So my grandfather being a barber, my great-grandfather rather, who because my, my grandfather was much younger, um, so they were both barbers when they went to this town of Glen Campbell. And um, they, as I said, there were very few, Itali if any, Italian families there. But my grandfather, uh, one day, 1925, this was the end of the letters that I was, one of the very last letters that I had in this packet was that my aunt, my great aunt writes to my grandmother that, oh, she said, Fortun and my grandparents were both named Fortunato and Fortunata. Um, so she says, Fortunata, I am so sorry. She said, I went all the way to the train station with your brother and my niece, who's my mother. And um, when the train came, my brother put, handed your daughter to his mother and they went on one train and my brother took off on another train. I don't know where he is. And as God is my witness on the death of my father or whatever, she swore that that was the truth. My grandfather took off for Syracuse, New York. In between another marriage, that I certainly don't know how he managed, but he did. And he took off for Syracuse, New York, eventually married another woman from a German American family and had two sons. He was a head of the Barber's Union there. He was a high level Mason, which was extremely rare for an Italian. Um, so I did a lot of research thanks to the library in Syracuse and other other avenues, newspapers.com, to find, to sort of kind of travel his life as much as I could. But my mother never saw him again. Neither did my grandmother. And he ended That's up- horrible. With, I, he ended and, up, and so he just, he just took off, huh? 
just took off. And back then, you know, Syracuse and Pittsburgh, it was actually Uniontown, which is a bit south of Pittsburgh, but Uniontown to Syracuse was like going to the moon for these people. You know, how could they have ever, they knew where he was yeah. uh, because of relatives that knew, but that was it. Nobody ever saw him again. So I built up this fantasy in my mind about this, this handsome, because he was, uh, kind of dashing, very Americanized grandfather. I believe at the end of the book, when I, after as much research as I've done, I believe the reason he left was because he wanted to get away from that Sicilian um, backward immigrant greenhorn uh, way of living, which was my grandmother's family. They were, they were uneducated, um, you know, as many immigrants were back then. And he wanted a different life. And he knew he wasn't able to have that with my grandmother because she wouldn't leave left my mother with a very troubled life. Uh, very yeah, sad. That's, that's sad. That's really, that really sad. sad. Um, so just one quick note, my great grandfather, uh, who was, you know, the, the, the one from the noble family, Pier Malo, he was uh, illegitimate. And I, when I found his record, uh, and I didn't know what it meant, somebody had to explain it to me, it says, uh, filio naturale oh. right which is in italian means illegitimate oh. and um and he's got you know on his birth record there's a long thing written and and it looks like his mother was a woman called maria leone um because he's got two i call them birth cards they just have the name of the father and the mother and the date of the birth and all of that uh, and he's got one that says Maria Leone, and then he has one that says Maria Savino as his mother. Maria mm -hmm. Savino is the mother of all his siblings. Oh. So I think, I oh. mean, again, you know, you have to try and piece this stuff oh. together in oh. your mind. I think what happened was uh, because he was from a well-to-do family that um, my, my second great-grandfather was able to claim him rather than the mother you know and you know we're talking 1860s here so you know the men had all the rights and and then uh maria savino probably adopted him in some kind of way so that it she he shows up as her her son interesting oh these these findings are just fascinating because you do have to interject some of your own you yeah know, you do suppositions into it but i find it really interesting um and who knows i mean the, it, it also i found out reading angelo's book and talking with him as well that oftentimes when these children were named they would the priest or whoever mostly i guess it was the priest who named them if he was kind of of a such a nature that he was you know could give them a name that was would mark them as being illegitimate for the rest of their lives or a name that was like comical like fiery musco which is horsefly um really yeah and or they would give them like fragile which is strawberry but if he was of a kindly nature he would often give a name that was like my mother, grandmother was lucky she got the name carbone um there are there were at that time no carbones living in that area um I went back four times to that, where to the uh, those ancestral towns in Sicily, which was quite an experience. Something yeah, I, I I know, and and uh, for, for you know for the people listening, you've been there fifty. You you by far have the record fifty five times. So <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't think, well, actually, I <laughs> well that I've talked to anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I went. Well, I went there because I was a food writer for a while, and uh, sort of became it by. I just default because after going to Italy, I was years ago, I'd go with my family and my young daughters. And then after I was divorced, I, it, it, Italy gave me um, a, a, a way to build a new life. And so I, um, I started writing, I, I did various things. I was writing about food mostly and zucchini was really easier to write about than your family. I have to tell you, <laughs> I, I could, I could throw out a, an article on artichokes, which I did in no time, but uh, writing about your family and yourself is, is something else. It takes, it's very time consuming and, and difficult. I know, and I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of it now. I mean, I've, I'm kind of finished, but we're 28 days, finally, we're going. We were supposed to go two yeah. years. We were supposed to go yeah. a month after COVID hit in 2020. Uh, 
and um, we have postponed it, then we postponed it again last year. So we're, we're going. Uh, so when you and, go back, I'm sorry. Um, do, you, do you go back to where your family was from, I'm assuming? Well, you know, we, we had only been there once when my son was a baby in, in 95. Um, and I didn't really know anything back then. So uh, I was supposed to go back to my, my mother's hometown and, uh, and meet my cousin there. And there was a plane blew up over the Atlantic Ocean and he chickened out, so we didn't get there. So we really just in, you know, Rome and, and Sorrento um, and didn't do that much. What I had found out since then is that my, uh, both sets of my father's family uh, lived a half a mile from the train station. Uh, and we were at the train station uh, going from uh, Naples to Sorrento. Uh, uh, um, so I, I, I'm working with somebody from uh, Letizia Sinisi from Italy Rooting, and she's put together a whole package. She won't tell me what we're going to uh, see, but uh, we're going to go back to my father's uh, families, some of the hometowns, uh, Capricota we're uh, going to, and Avellino. Uh, and then Montebello and Calabria. And then we're going to go over to uh, my wife's families from Shaka in Sicily. So we're going to go over to there. So, well, you know, two weeks, but she has, and I'm going to meet cousins that I never knew existed oh, up oh. until a little while ago. Oh, oh it's, it's just a wonderful experience. I have a chapter in my book called All My Uncle Tony's. So the first time <laughs> I went there, <laughs> This was my, my, my ex-husband and my daughters were young and I didn't know there was anybody there. I thought I had a letter though, that my, another letter from another side of the family um, that was written to my grandmother's side. So we were staying in a hotel in Taormina. So I took the letter to the concierge and I said, you know, this is the address. This was sent to my great grandfather decades ago. Um, can you, he says, don't, he's go to lunch and come back. I thought, oh, he's gonna send us to the archives. I came back and he takes this old fashioned black telephone out from my, this was back in, I guess, 94 or five. He takes this old black telephone out. He puts it on, he dials a number. He gets on the phone. He found my family. He found in this little town where they were from, he was able to figure out who they were. The next day we get in the car, the, this little American family with, you know, suitcases and two young people just screaming, we are from America. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> We, we drive down the street, we stop the car, and I get out and I look around and I ask somebody, he said, oh, she says, senora, she said, I think you want to go that way. So we started walking down the street. People started coming out of their houses, a little near walkway. I saw this first man come out. I said, oh my gosh, that looks like my grandfather, Filippo. And then, oh God, that looks like my Uncle Tony. And then pretty soon, every, I swear to you, Bob, everybody looked like my Uncle Tony because the gene pool there was so small yeah. that they all looked alike. They really did. And it, that was a wonderful experience. Nobody spoke. I didn't speak Italian. We sat down at their table. They, they had like less than 24 hours to know we were coming. They invited us into their home. The older man who was my grand, it turned out to be my grandmother's first cousin that we didn't even know they were still there. And he, he, he went, he, he, I could say a few words in Italian. He thought I was fluent. So I got through the whole dinner, all of us, just me saying, see, 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 see. And at the end, he stood up and he took the peaches. This was in the summer. He took peaches and wine through the, through the peaches and everybody's wine glass, including the kids. My children had never forgotten that moment. It was just such a beautiful, beautiful memory. Um, yeah, and yeah, so and like I said, I wound up connecting with one of my Piromalo cousins who I never knew. And once we pieced it together, she's been connecting people for me. And just within the last month or so, uh, my great grandfather had a second family. My great grandmother died when she was like 40 years old. Um, and he married a woman that was six months older than my grandmother. He was 60, she was 30. Uh, and she had two daughters. And I had never known any, any of that. And um, I finally was in contact with somebody, uh, one of my great uncle's uh, sons. And then I, out of the blue, I get another message from somebody the, who's the grandson of one of my grandmother's half sisters. Um, so he's a first cousin once removed and he had photographs of my grandmother's brothers. 
oh. that nobody oh. had ever seen before. Oh, oh wonderful. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, you know, I tell people all the time, you know, you have to keep digging. Sometimes yeah. you have to walk away, take a break. Yeah. I said, but when you come back, there's always something that pops up. Always, always. I, I mean, I still do it. I, you know, um, I go on, sometimes I go online at night, you know, the Mormon church, the church of Latter-day Saints are, you know, they have so much information. And I go on and I find things and I just spend hours and lose, losing eyesight to, and, but you come up with things occasionally, you do. Uh, it, fills, it fills in those little holes, you know, of the story. Um, so, so before we go, I just want to, so now is the book finished or are you in the, the process of? No, no, I'm in the process. I've been, honestly, Bob, I've been writing this book for four years and, um, it, because it's changed a lot of it was my my mother passed away at the age of 98 two years ago i i don't think i could have written the book had she been alive she um so part of it is really a mother-daughter memoir that is braided with this family history of why my mother was so troubled and i have um uh, I've gone through all the different things that I was led to believe as I was growing up about my grandfather. There's a, I found out about a missing child that I still, there was a child born to my grandfather's sister in Pennsylvania that I have the birth record, but that's, she disappears. There was a, a court case that I got from a researcher, a librarian in Johnstown, Pennsylvania about an assault on my great grandfather by my aunt's jealous husband. And um, as it turned out, he was, he attacked them with a knife and he went after his wife and her father, which is my great grandfather with a knife. But guess what? She was charged with adultery. So charges against him were dropped. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> but, uh, that was a long time ago, I guess. It was yeah. a long time ago. It was, it was that you can try to kill somebody, but you know, don't have an affair with another. Yeah, man. right. So, um, yeah, it, it was going through and, and sort of correcting all of these myths that were, were in the family. Um, and I found it fascinating. And I, of course, going back in time with the history and uh, there's a lot of, you know, that I kind of intersperse about Sicilians and their feelings of, against Garibaldi and, and against uh, the fact that they were got the short end of the stick after reunification. That's right. Yep. The whole South, the whole South got devastated. Yeah. Uh, and that that's, you know, that's an amazing, sad story too. how they just whatever what whatever wealth was in the, the South all got sent to the North. Yeah, if you ever I'm sure you've probably seen El Gato Pardo, the leopard, the movie, yeah, yeah, yeah. which yeah. is, you know, just it, it, when I see that movie, it was a beautiful way of life for a few people, <laughs> you know, but the rest of the people, there was no future. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, one thing that I learned, which I never knew, and, and I you know, I, I wondered why all the uh, the nobility all they all lived in Naples, uh, and they didn't pay taxes. Ah, oh, wow! The nobility did not pay taxes. The people paid the taxes to oh, them. Yes. But they didn't pay any taxes yeah. to, to the yeah. government. I was shocked yeah. by that. Yeah, that know? is shocking. I didn't know yeah, that. yeah. It's, but it's knowing um... Italy, I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I I think all those feudal type places ran That's like true. that. But on the other hand. You know the people the tenant farmers at least had had the land and yes. they could sustain themselves right. after 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 the reunification or unification they lost everything yes. because they were selling off the land and if you yes. didn't have the money to buy it you know there was and nothing the that you could do. Yeah, yeah yeah and you uh, the, the, the mafia thing you know it's like every italian has to have the mafia in their supposedly, which is really, this is something that Angelo Canuglio is very sensitive about. Uh, this idea that, you know, if you have, for those who aren't Italian, if you have an Italian name, or especially if you're successful, you ha it has to be mafia. You know, they're just, that's the way it is. And not people not realizing that most Italians have no mafia, you know, in their background. Oh, right. in yeah. their, it's just, <laughs> and in yeah. fact, in Italy, they get very offended too. I, I remember talking to a friend in Rome and he's, I said, this is the height of the Godfather days. And I said, what do you think about the Godfather? Uh, oh no, I'm sorry, not the Godfather, the Sopranos. And he said, it has nothing to do with us. That's not our culture. It's an American culture, not, not an Italian culture. Though. Yeah. There's, yeah. That's right. That, that, that's true. Um, and you know, people don't, people don't really understand that. Um, so, um, when do you think you might be finished? I know that's a tough question to ask because I've been finishing mine for months now. <laughs> uh, 
So what is your book? Uh, well, to answer your question, I'm hoping, uh, uh, hoping to have it going to press in a year. I just don't know okay. how, it, it just takes a long time. I need a development. Oh, no. I'm at the point where I need, probably I'm gonna have to have a developmental editor pretty soon. And um, we'll see, you know, I, I've got it pretty well structured. It's just, it's like, I'm never finished. It's like icing a cake. You always wanna do one more little curl and make it pretty. Yeah, yeah. and you know, I, I, you know, I thought I was finished, but now that we're going to Italy, I, I said, well, you know, now I'm gonna to have to wait and get the pictures yeah. from there and, and you know, write so that part book? of the story. Is your book? Uh, my book is basically about, you know, my research, finding my, families a little bit about background about my growing up in corona queens and what that was like with two italian american families uh and then a little bit about uh you know what i found how i did my research and like a short primer on how to look things up on the antonati and things like that so uh, well i might uh, i'm sorry uh I, I might you know they changed the whole structure of looking at you know finding the records now yeah and i'm a little bit lost with that so i may uh, ask you for some advice later on sure thing sure sure get in there again um well listen this has been great fantastic story we'll all wait for the book when you do when you finish the book we're, we're gonna have to interview you again really i would love to bob yeah and keep me posted on your your trip to italy i'd be very curious how that that you know transpires um always interested in that i will i will thanks again thank you thank you it was a pleasure